So thanks, Poppy, for inviting us to come and speak um, today. Um, so I am Guav Jones and I'm a Senior Earth Observation Specialist at JNCC and we are doing a double act today. Um, so I'm doing a double act with my colleague Cathy, who is an application developer here at JNCC. Um, in case some of you online are not familiar, um, we are a public body that advises the UK government and devolved administrations and overseas territories on UK-wide and international nature conservation. And uh, we are essentially an impartial scientific authority and we provide a by some practical policy relevant um, and evidence-based solutions to support decision making. Uh, next slide, Cathy. Um, so basically that means that JNCC sits on the science policy interface um, and we do a lot of research um, maybe not academic research but um, um, you know different variety of different sorts of research and science to make sure that the advice that we give is relevant and suitable for user requirements and needs. Uh, as a UK wide body, we do work with multiple governments. Um, so all the devolved governments and public sector bodies, as well as international governments. Um, so, uh, you know, we do work quite widely across the environmental sector. But today we're focused on how we're integrating Earth observation or EO data sets into some of those applications. Um, so while we don't necessarily carry out um, blue skies research, um, we do what we would call something uh, like research and development. And our ultimate goal is to transform the knowledge that comes out of academia and uh, in the private sector and a whole host of other places um, to operational use within the public sector agencies. So at that point, we hand over what we know and, and um, help others develop operational workflows. So this sometimes involves us carrying out research of services that already exist and advise users on suitability in relation to their requirements. But in the field of EO, we've been doing a lot of development of products ourselves at JNCC, following the proof of concept route to demonstrate value. Uh, in many cases, we do work closely with academic partners in this field, um, but most importantly, we almost always collaborate with the end user from the very beginning so that we bring them with us um, and and while we might undertake the research at Jane's to see the development component is almost always carried out jointly with uh, end users or um, users. Um, and, you know, we've been using Jasmine um, in a way to help people um, understand workflows. So next slide, Kathy. Um, so we do let, do a lot of applications uh, across the environmental sector, as we said. Um, so today, I'll be, I'm not really going to talk about any of these applications in detail, but mostly how we've used the services available um, in Jasmine and the benefits of the variety of services and how they've helped us come to a workflow. And nearly all of these are now uh, have a, a working methodology. So one of our key uh, activities that we at JNCC undertake on Jasmine is the routine production of Sentinel-1 and 2 analysis ready data. And this is because most of our research within EO requires standardized data sets from these uh, um, satellite uh, data. Um, and given the operational nature of Copernicus and the guarantee of long-term data provision, that is why the Sentinels are one of our key focus areas. Um, so JNCC have been producing ARD for over five years in various guises, and while we've successfully created an automated service in England and handed over the responsibility to somebody else, um, the, that service is called the DEFRA Earth Observation Data Service, JNCC is still continuing to produce ARD in Scotland and Northern Ireland for those, uh, and that, that service is funded respectively by those governments. Now the English service and the Scottish and Northern Irish equivalents are linked and we are using the same processing chains um, and all the data is openly accessible to anybody on CEDA. So the other applications that are all based on the Sentinel 1 and 2 data are three Scottish applications, so uh, a workflow trying to detect wildfire and muirburn monitoring ac um, across Scotland, that's using the Sentinel 2 data sets at scale. 
there's a, a project that we did trying to use Sentinel-1 coherence data um, to detect illegal waste with the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and we've also been supporting the Scottish government in generating a Scottish crop map experimental statistic with the Sentinel-1 backscatter data. And all three of these projects have been funded by the Caroline Herschel Framework for Copernicus User Uptake. Um, while the last two, so uh, the habitat change detection, so that this is a key uh, strategic work area for JNCC, and we've been um, using EO data to try and detect changes in habitats. Um, and one of the key areas for us here is moving from site-based change detection to um, doing that at scale, hopefully being able to do something at national scale in the future. Um, and the last application that we mentioned today is we um, were funded by the DEFRA Earth Observation Centre of Excellence Research and Development Funds to um, do an investigation on data cubes in the context of um, what do end users need to know about data cubes to understand if that's the right solution for them. Given the popularity of this architectural solution in conjunction with EO data sets at the moment, there's a lot out there. How do you know which one is the most uh, suitable solution for you? So now I'm going to hand over to Cathy. Okay, thanks, Claire. So I'm going to try and whiz through the services that are actually used for each of those projects mentioned. Um, so I'll start with the ARD, pro ARD production, um, which might be old news to some, but it shows a good spread of the services used. So we run what we call the simple ARD service, which produces ARD for Scotland and Northern Ireland on a weekly basis. So Every week we're downloading about 150 gigabytes of raw ESA data. So we use a Jasmine Expo server and a small file group workspace to speed this up because the downloads are usually unzipped. And so there's lots of small files to handle. And that leaves us with about 30 Sentinel-1 scenes and 80 Sentinel-2 granules, which we parallel process in Lotus. And we use the work scratch areas for our intermediate file storage because they tend to be quite big and the Sentinel-2 processing also uses MPI. So we need the parallel write ability that Work Scratch PW gives us. So that leaves us with the outputs, which we store in our public area in our group workspace um, until they're ready to be ingested into Cedar. So public area is a web accessible area and that provides early dissemination of the products for those who need it. And then they go through a QA process before uh, they're ready to ingest into CEDA. So previously our QAs would have had to download the ARD onto their local machines to stick into a local QGIS, which is obviously really broadband dependent and time consuming. Um, but after some back and forth with Jasmine support, we found that what, what worked for us was running QGIS in a singularity container via an NX login server via no machine um, and that lets us use these kinds of graphical applications like QGIS in a responsive way. So after that, they're ready to be ingested into Cedar, which for us just involves saving them into a group workspace, which is nice and easy. And yeah, so that's a summary of our ARD production in Jasmine services. So next up we have three Scottish Copernicus user uptake projects, which will use EO data. So I've stuck a link there for anyone who wants more information. Um, these projects are done in partnership between JNCC and Scottish government agencies. So we provide the EO expertise and are kind of the Jasmine intermediary for them. And so we ask them to onboard onto Jasmine and we arrange for separate group workspaces for them to do their work in. And we also provide them access to our sci analysis tenancies, um, in which we have our own dedicated sci analysis VMs, which is kind of a safe space for them to test out their resource intensive processing in a Jasmine environment, um, which can be useful because they might not be used to Linux environments or non interactive batch compute. Um, so the sci analysis tenancies are in the managed Jasmine environment. So they have access to Lotus for further upscaling if they need it. And that depends on the project. So sometimes the sci analysis VMs are enough because Lotus does have a bit of a learning curve and an overhead in having to create the jobs and wait for the jobs to start running and so on. Um, 
So, but yeah, we make it available if they need it. So because it's a managed environment, it also means that there's no need to handle any patching. So for us, there's minimal maintenance, which is great. Um, and more importantly, you get direct access to CEDAR for the ARD. So this is something that Sarah has mentioned in her presentation. Um, it's following the concept of bringing your, your compute to where your data is, which is a huge time and resource saver. And it's something that we take advantage of a lot um, by using Jasmine. So yeah, so that's all trying to provide an environment with the resources that these projects might need in order to do their work. So have that changed section um, is an application that produces statistics um, to identify change for indices like NDMI, NDVI, RVI for Sentinel-1, um, which are derived from our ARD in CEDAR. So again, direct access to CEDAR is really useful. And what we're doing here is upscaling. So the upscaling is done in stages. The proof of concept was done at a site level, um, various sites. I think the biggest one was Dark Peak. And the initial test on Jasmine was done for Yorkshire. Um, and this kind of iterative upscaling helps us to identify issues and address them early on, which is good because it's not usually a smooth process. Um, so for example, we've currently processed two years of stats for Yorkshire using Lotus, which was fine in that it gave us the stats we were expecting, or the stats outputs we were expecting. But just for Yorkshire alone, we ended up with a 40 gigabyte database with millions and millions of rows. And we also would have had millions and millions of tiny 10 kilobyte thumbnail files. And both of those would have just been a huge pain to do any operations on. So we're going through a process of refinement before upscaling to a UK level by looking into using serverless ways of querying the stats and also by dynamically generating the thumbnail files instead of pre-generating them. And yeah, it's definitely better that we're dealing with this now rather than after spending weeks and weeks processing and generating a UK level 400 gigabyte database and then sitting there and wondering what to do with it. So the EO data cube. So this is an example um, of an application in our in one of our Jasmine unmanaged cloud tenancies. So um, the project was to set up a proof of concept EO data cube. Um, and for those who don't know, um, an open data cube is essentially a Python library that sits on top of the Postgres database. And it lets you do some powerful querying and analysis of the data, which in our case was our Sentinel 1 and 2 ARD. So how was this implemented? It involved stringing a few services together. So we used an object store tenancy to host ARD um, with the data cube just linking to files in it. So we populated that from Cedar using, um, I think it was Lotus in the end. Um, and we wanted the data cube to be fronted by Jupyter notebooks, which would be accessible by non-Jasmine users. So to do that, we needed an unmanaged cloud tenancy, Jasmine cloud tenancy, which comes with handy cluster as a service solutions. So uh, we used an identity manager cluster for user management and a Pangeo cluster for the Jupyter notebooks on Kubernetes solution. And we also needed a Postgres database. So we just created a standalone VM uh, that ran a containerized Postgres instance. And yeah, so that's still running and being assessed by end users right now. Um, but by doing, by going through that process, we already have a clearer understanding of how to set up and maintain this sort of system. So Jasmine services, um, I've created a very rough and ready diagram here to give you an idea of our thought process as we pick the different services to use. It definitely doesn't include all the services or even all of our considerations, but that ended up being very messy. So you get this simplified view instead. Um, I realize the internal external split might be a bit misleading, but essentially internal here is supposed to mean only accessible from within Jasmine by Jasmine users, whereas external means accessible by pretty much everyone. And so, yeah, for example, um, if we have a project that needs kind of private collaborative storage, then they get a group workspace. Uh, if they also need the files to be publicly accessible, then we can slap a public area on top of that. 
Um, so yeah, that's supposed to give you an idea of the range of services that we think about and that there is a learning curve to knowing what to use. And a lot of the process of us going through that is has been talking to Jasmine support and they've helped us figure all of this out. Um, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> so in conclusion, Jasmine offers a wide range of services which covers most of our project needs, which is great. And it provides a platform for uh, letting us work in partnership with other public sector agencies um, to continue their research and development by learning how to upscale and operationalize their processes. And ultimately that enables development of in-house capabilities to empower agencies to become a more intelligent customer. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening and happy to take questions.